title of my message is Take Back Your Territory or Taking Back Your Territory. If you are taking notes, I'm going to try to go slow. We're probably going to um, end a little bit early, but we're going to go and we're going to stay in Judges 6. So if you have your phone or your Bible, go to Judges 6. And um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read it all because there's so much. And so I'm going to um, save you guys from that. So I'm just going to summarize for you what happens in Judges 6. So um, basically, Judges 6, it starts, it's a story about Gideon. And Gideon doesn't appear in the story about until like 10 verses down. But this story is about Israel and how Israel is rebelling, how Israel rebelled against God. And so what happened is God gave Israel land, okay? God gives Israel land. And what happened is that they rebelled against God. So then what happened next? God allowed enemies to come and oppress Israel And you know what they did? Israel gave up the land that God gave them. Their own land. They gave it up because God allowed that, because they were disobedient to God. And so Israel was forced into small confinement. You know, they were the Bible says that they were hiding in caves, that they were forced out of their land. Um, And it's really sad, and, you know, I can imagine that it feels like the breath that they have is being taken away from them because they are so oppressed. In their own land, the enemy took over. And so finally what happens is that the Midianites and the Amalekites, these are the bad guys who invaded Israel, the land of Israel, they, what they did is that they not only invaded their land, But you know what they did? They also took over their crops. And every single thing that Israel had, they wiped it clean. Like every dish they had in their kitchen, every plant that they had planted in their garden, every potato, like it was wiped clean, okay? There was nothing left. And the poor Israelites were shaking in their boots and hiding in caves. And so what happened, finally, finally, Israel was like, you know what? We can't stand this anymore. We cannot, we can't live like hermits. Like this can't happen to us. This is our land that God gave us. And what they did is they cried out to God. And let's see, this is what the Lord says. So what God did is God sent a prophet that reminded Israel how God led them out of Egypt and how he was faithful the whole way through. He reminded them of his instruction on not to serve other gods because that's the reason why Israel got in trouble in the first place. That's why the Amalekites took over and the Midianites took over is because they forgot who their god was and they served other gods. So you don't do that. You know that's what makes God mad, right? And so what happens, this is where Gideon comes into the picture, And an angel of the Lord appears to Gideon and calls him mighty warrior, like Andre said. See, I told you, I'm like just re-preaching his sermon, no big deal. Mighty warrior, God is with you. And when I, I'm not even kidding, but when I read my Bible, sometimes it's really funny to me, especially when it's, you know, when the Bible, uh, the scripture was talking about Gideon, how he was the least in his tribe and how he was the weakest. And then this angel of God appears and calls him mighty warrior. And I just had a total LOL moment. And I was laughed, like I laughed out loud at that point. I was like, this is hilarious. I'm going to keep reading. This is so good. And then what happens is Gideon, Gideon asks, but if God is with me, why is this happening? Why Are all my people being persecuted? Why are we going into hiding? Where are the wonders and the promises that that God promised? Where are the things that our ancestors spoke and told us about? And this is what the angel of the Lord said. Go in strength. for um, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. I am God. I will be with you. You, and you will strike down the Midianites, leaving none alive. 
So the title of my message tonight is Take Back Your Territory. Take Back Your Territory. So we're going to bow our heads real quick and we're going to pray and then we'll go into the scripture. Lord, we thank you so much for tonight. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are leading us, Lord, in our hearts, Lord, closer to you tonight, that you are bringing a revelation into our hearts. Lord, I pray, Father, for your anointing and your blessing, Lord, that is already here, that you will carry, Lord, every word, Lord, that you have put on my heart, God, that you will fill in the blanks and Holy Spirit, Lord, I depend on you and I need you, Jesus. And Lord, in your name we pray. Amen. So taking back your territory, what does that mean? What does taking back your territory mean and how does it relate to you? We saw what taking back your territory meant for Gideon when the angel of the Lord called him, but what does that mean to you? Well, taking back your territory, it means taking back the healing and believing in the that God has for you. It means taking back God's promises for you, in other words, okay? Um, believing in salvation for your friends, for your family. It means taking back the vision and the dream that God put on your life that the devil t- tries to steal by telling you that you're not good enough, that you're not strong enough, and by showing you your neighbor who you think is better than you at the dream that you have that God put on your heart, okay? Uh, taking back your territory also talks about, is about your gift, giftings and your talents. You know, that fear of not stepping out in faith and trying something new and doing something new because you're passionate about it because God said, you know, that you have a feeling on your heart that God is telling you that you could do this, that you have a talent for this. It means believing that your school and your workplace will be saved. Why? Because God put you there. And when God puts you there, he gives you that territory. So when God gives you that territory, that means that is not, that means that God placed you there to use you. And if you are not obedient to God, and if you don't step out in faith, he'll use someone else. And we don't want that. We want God to use us because we want to be, we want to bring glory to God. And so I'm going to, we're going to dissect uh, Gideon really fast, and then I'm going to give you three points, and then we're going to finish. Is that, is that, does that sound good to you guys? Okay, so how this message came about on my heart is actually last week, I was sitting at work, and it was like really early in the morning. I get to, I start work at about 7.30 in the morning, and the way that our office is set up is we have long white tables, and then we have computers on each side of the table, and it's just like people like crowding around, and it's an open office space, like there are no, there's like maybe a couple cubes on the side, but um, it's all open, so like everyone sees everything, like your desk always has to be clean, it's super annoying, like I, <laughs> I really try so hard to be organized, but it's hard, um, so I came into work that morning, and my coworkers, uh, two of my coworkers, one that sits across from me, and one that sits beside me. Uh, the one that sits across from me, she uh, is a middle-aged lady. She has two kids that she loves and she talks about all the time. Um, she takes them to youth groups. She tells me because she knows that I'm a Christian, and I tell her all the time. Um, and then there's another gal that sits next to me. She's also a little older. She's married. So I get to work, and these two gals are already there. They beat me that morning to work. And they're talking. They're, like, having a really serious conversation. I'm, like, half asleep, and I'm listening to their conversation. Their their conversation is so full of hate. And I'm like, what are they talking about? And they were talking about, you know, one of the ladies was like, man, you know, if I, if there was just like a pool, if we had like a pool and we can all just throw in some money and we can get that guy and like that, someone can like just take care of him and that will be the end of it. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, I didn't say anything, but I was like, what in the Lord's name? Are they talking about killing someone? Like, cause that's kind of what it sounds like. They're like pulling in money to, to assassinate someone. And it was really early in the morning. And then it clicked in my head. I'm like, oh, my gosh. They're talking about the president-elect, okay? And t- tonight, this is not, I'm not talking about politics. I don't want to. I didn't want to even bring this conversation in. But this, conversa- but this um, example is what is going to make most sense. Um, and so what they were talking about is they were talking about assassinating the president-elect. At that moment, 
my blood boiled so hot within me and everything within me wanted to scream no and everything within me wanted to scream but how about love but everything within me wanted to scream do you know the Lord let me tell you about him that the Lord is love and we do not tolerate that and I wanted to take back that atmosphere of hate that they created and I wanted to turn it into love and you know what I did I sat there and I listened to them talk and the blood was, my blood was boiling in me so hot. I wanted to tell them so bad that what they were saying was wrong, but I kept quiet because I was like, you know what? I don't want to talk about politics at work. And that's like my one thing is I, I don't want to get into that. I don't want to talk about that. And you know, later that day, I had such a strong conviction on my heart the Lord was saying, Christina, why didn't you say something? Why didn't you stand up for love? I'm not saying stand up for, you know, the president-elect or Trump or anything. I'm saying why, the Lord told me, why didn't you stand up for love? Why? That is your territory. That is where I put you. Why didn't you stand up? And so I had such a strong conviction. And, you know, I believe tonight that God is going to, invite you and call some of you to stand in the territory that he has put you in. It might be territory, you know, of, of healing. Maybe God is, wants to bring healing into your life, but you just don't have enough faith to receive it. It might be a territory of forgiveness, you know, um, whatever that it may be, whatever territory it is. Um, so I invite you. So we're going to go over um, judges really quick. So when Israel rebelled, and they had to hide in the land that their God gave them. They surrendered their possession. You know why? Because they did not have enough faith to fight for it. They didn't have faith to fight for their territory, right, that God gave them. But when God promises on your life are of strength, are of joy, and of hope, and of peace, those are the promises of God on your life. You know, sometimes we forget them or we put them aside because we let fear come and take over our territory. And when that fear, it comes, it cripples us. And that fear pushes out the faith that we have, that God has given us, that strength and the confidence that God has given us. And so what these people did is they went into hiding. And we're so quick, you know, to trade things that belong to us, such as strength, such as joy, such as hope, and such as peace, and such as hope, and such as faith when trials come. It's our nature. Um, you know what happened when Adam and Eve, when they first stepped into sin, you know what was the first thing that they did? What was it? They hid. They hid. Isn't that funny? They hid. There was only two of them in the whole garden. How can you hide? But you know what's so funny is that now there's millions of us on this earth, and yet we still choose to hide from a God who is all-knowing, who is all-powerful, who created us, who put inside us a spirit of boldness and of peace and of joy. But our fear, it casts that out. And so, you know, we need to fight for our faith um, because, and you know, Timothy, in 1 Timothy, I'm not going to read it, but it talks about fighting the good fight of faith, taking over the territory that God has given you. We're not fight. I'm not talking about tonight about fighting a fight against the enemy. Tonight, I want to talk about fighting a fight of faith holding on to that faith and not letting it go, carrying that faith into your workplace, into your school, so that you will be able to take over that territory, carrying that faith when you're praying for healing for your, your friend or for your grandma or for someone in your family or when you're praying for salvation or, you know, when you're praying, when you're driving somewhere and you're praying, like, God protect me, you know, wherever I go, whatever I'm doing. So faith, fight the good fight of faith. Next thing is that God gave um, the Israel to their enemies, which oppressed them, and Israel was forced into small confinement. So what happens when we're forced into small confinement? The small confinement that I'm talking about is fear. That is small confine confinement. What happens a lot of time is that the reason why we don't speak up and the reason why we don't take over our territory 
is because we choose not to be non-confrontational. We choose to be, and then non-confrontation leads to passiveness. Now, I'm not saying that you should always be non-confrontational. There's definitely a, a right time and there's definitely a wrong time, okay? But what happens is that we say, oh, God, no, I'm, I don't want to say anything to my coworkers because clearly they're so passionate and they are so angry. And even though the blood within me is boiling, I want to be non-confrontational because I don't want to talk about politics at work. No, I really, just, Lord, give me another chance, another time. Like, I will tell them, but not right now. So what happens is that's the lie of the enemy is he tells us, you, you only speak up when you're comfortable. You only speak up when you want to or when you can because don't be confrontational. Um, and so the devil silence us, silences us in that way because we don't have enough faith to overcome that. And so in the same way, when the truth of God is challenged at your school or at work, we rather sit in silence than speak up in truth. But don't choose to surrender your faith. Choose to grab hold of your faith. Finally, what happens is the Midianites and the Amalekites, they invade Israel and all their crops, and they don't leave a single thing. And God sends a prophet to remind Israel of how God led them out of Egypt and how he saved them and how he delivered them and how God was faithful all the way through, through the water, through Israel being thirsty, through Israel um, being hungry, God sent manna. Um, and so the angel of the Lord, he, when he calls Gideon, he calls a mighty warrior, God is with you. What happens is Israel didn't believe that the land was theirs. When the enemy came back, when the enemy came and took it away because they didn't have faith to stand up for it. They didn't have faith. They couldn't stand. They were shaking in their boots. Um, and so what God says is, the reason why God calls Gideon mighty warrior is because God wanted to refresh Gideon's memory of who he is. He's like, listen, young buck, you are a mighty warrior. You may be least in your clan. You may be skinniest. You may be shortest. You may be weakest. But you know what? But those are all the things that the world defines you, and those are characteristics of the world that defines you. But do you know the characteristics and how the almighty, all-powerful God who created you defines you? He calls you almighty warrior. Tonight, God is calling you. He's calling you a strong, mighty woman of faith. He's calling you strong man of God. Tonight, God is calling you to take over the territory that he has given you. And so what happens is... Um, after God tells Gideon, Gideon says, I'm the weakest and I'm the least. And God says, I will be with you and, I, and you will strike down the Midianites, leaving none alive. I really wanted to point out the fact that God says, you will strike down the Midianites. God didn't say, I will strike down the Midianites. He's like, no, listen, I just told you who you are. I just called you mighty warrior of God. Now I'm going to prove to you that you can do this because my spirit is alive in you. I made you strong. I made you powerful. And listen, I'm going to prove to you that you can do this if you believe the words that I am saying. And so what happens is that um, God is sending me and you. He is sending me into my workplace. He's sending you into your school, into your neighborhood. He knows who you are. He knows that you are his child created in his image. You are created in the image of God. Now, we know the characteristics of God and who God is, right? And now when we look in the mirror, we need to know that the person that is reflected in the mirror is created in the image of God. And sometimes that person, that mirror, can be, that can be a really fuzzy picture. And the reason why that mirror can be so fuzzy sometimes is because we do not believe what we read. We do not believe the promises that God is pointing out to us in Scripture and in the Word of God. And so we are equipped, but we don't believe it. 
And this is, and um, Lord says, this is how you know that you are my child, that there will be signs and wonders that will follow. We are not supposed to be passive. You know, Jesus was confrontational when he was on earth. Do you think so? Would you, would you say so? I would. Jesus was confrontational, and this is why. He made people feel uncomfortable. But why? Why would a loving God make people feel uncomfortable? You know why? Because God is light. And whenever light comes into darkness and light permeates the darkness, it exposes sin. It makes you uncomfortable. It opens your eyes to see the things are, are in your life that are wrong. And so silence is deadly. But when you walk in the light, sometimes people will feel uncomfortable. But you know what you need to do? You need to keep walking that good walk of faith. You need to be fighting that good fight of faith because that is what you are called to. That is your territory. Um, and so faith will prepare, will propel you to take over your territory. Now, I have a funny example for you guys, and then we're going to talk about three points of taking back your faith, and we're going to end. So, um, you know how, like, it's New Year, new, everyone says, New Year, New You, right? And everyone goes to the gym, and they're all working out. And so, I still haven't gone, I know. <laughs> it's really bad, I know. Trust me, I remind myself every day. It's really sad. I think I actually had a conversation with Roxy today about, like, confessing to her over text message. Roxy, I still haven't gone to the gym. Help me. I don't know what to do. Like, help. And then I was, like, making all these excuses, like, why I don't go to the gym? Because I have to wake up at, like, 5.15 a.m. And then by the time I get home, and it's, like, an hour commute there, an hour commute back. So I was crying like a baby to Roxy. And, but you know when you go to the gym and you're, like, working out, like, lifting weights or you're on the elliptical and, like, through your peripheral, or maybe sometimes you're just staring, but through, your perif through my peripheral, I always see this one girl. I always see her. I don't know who she is, but I know she's at your gym, too, if you go to the gym. But she is that girl that's, real in, like, real thin, and she's, like, working on that, that treadmill. And I am, like, what the heck are you doing at the gym? Like, you should not be at the gym. Like, you are in perfect shape. You look amazing. Like, if you lose any more weight, you, you'll break. Like, like I need, the Lord has called me to tell you, go home, eat a burger. Like, I am so worried about you. And you know, and you know what? This story is so funny. But this is such an example of us Christians. And you know how? Because us Christians are like that skinny girl on the treadmill. We are like that skinny girl who has no muscles, who's never worked out, but she's just naturally thin. And you know what they call those? Oh, by the way, BT dubs. They call those skinny people a skinny fat. You know why? Because even though they may look thin on the outside, but they have the highest percentage of body fat. Sometimes their body fat percentage is bigger than like a 200, 300 pound person because even though they look thin, their whole entire body is basically made of fat because they have no muscle. And so a lot of times that happens in our Christian walk and our Christian faith is a lot of times we read the word of God, right? We go through our Bible, we do our soap, we go to our small groups and we read the word and we think that we're building muscle. Oh, yeah, I'm going. I'm reading. I'm in the Word every day. Hallelujah, Jesus, I feel so good. And we think that we're, we're so ready. You know, we're doing so good. And then when it comes out, when it comes down to the nitty-gritty of trying to lift a weight, what happens? We crack and we fall. Why? First of all, we might not even touch the weight because we're terrified of it. Even though we've already practiced reading the word of God, even though we know the word of God, we're scared to act on it. We're scared to pick up that weight because we're scared that that weight will break us. We're scared. We don't believe that we have enough strength to pick up that weight and, you know, to build some muscle. But you know where muscle is built? Muscle is built when you expand your territory, when you take over your territory. And what that means is that muscle is built when you step out in faith. Okay, muscle is built when you tell someone about the Lord. Muscle is built when you stand up for love. 
Muscle is built when you stand up for truth. Muscle is built when you pray a prayer of healing over your friend and you don't for one second doubt that they will be healed. Why? Because they might not be healed right now at that second, but you know that you are praying to the Almighty God and the Almighty God will heal that person. Um, and so a couple of points of faith that I want to give to you, just three points real quick. Can you just wait one second on the keys? I'll let you know when, okay? Um, so point number one is believe. Believe in the territory that God has given you. Second Peter 1.4, it says, And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share in the divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. Point of that scripture is that because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. Don't skip out on the promises of God because of your fear. Don't be afraid to pick out that weight or step out in faith because of your fear. The only thing that's holding you back is your lack of faith in God's promises. You may know the Bible back and forth with eyes closed, but that does not believe that you are full of faith. You may just have memorized it, which doesn't really mean anything, actually. Philippians 4.19 says, But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ, by Christ Jesus. Another promise of God. One more promise of God. I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give you is a gift of the world cannot give. So do not be troubled or afraid. Don't be afraid to step out in faith. Don't be afraid to take over your territory. Wherever you go, stand up for love. Stand up for truth. Why? Because it says right here, God tells you that he's going to be with you. He says, do not be troubled or afraid. Point number two, receive. In order, after believing, you have to receive, right? Receive. You have to have faith to receive. Faith comes from hearing. We know that. And hearing comes from the word of God. That's Romans 10, 17, in case you didn't know. You will never be able to take back your territory without faith. Jesus talks about every time that Jesus healed someone, what did Jesus say? He said, your faith has healed you. Your faith has saved you. Your faith has made you well. In every single time, Jesus said, your faith. Your faith. Not your memorization of the word of God, not because you want something to happen, not because you think something will happen, but your faith has made you well. Your faith has healed you. Isaiah 40, 29 through 31, it says, he gives power to the weak. This is a promise of God. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired. This is talking about us. It's okay to become weak and tired. It is. The Bible talks about it. It's okay, it happens, right? And young men will fall into exhaustion, but those who trust in the Lord will find what? Will find new strength. Those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Amen, that is so good. What a promise of God on your life. Can you believe that? Did you know that? Well, tonight I'm calling you to believe that, not just to know that, and I'm calling you to act upon that. Point number three, and this is my last point. You can go ahead. Point number three is reclaim. So point number one was believe. Believe in the promises of God. Point number two, receive. Have faith to receive those and act upon them. Point number three, reclaim. Take possession of the land that your God has given you. The promises the workplace, the school, the neighborhood, the house that you live in. Maybe there's no peace in your house. Maybe you're going through some things. Reclaim peace. Reclaim joy. Those are the promises of God for you. Reclaim 1 Timothy 6.12. It says, fight the good fight for true faith. Hold tightly to eternal life to which God has called you. Your faith is an action. It should be an action. Your faith should not just be an exercise, you running on the treadmill and being a skinny fat. No, your faith 
should be muscle building. Your faith should be you stepping out in accordance to the word of God. Sometimes it's, it's not comfortable, but you know what? God didn't call you to live a com- comfortable life. God called you to live a victorious life, but God did not call you, to, and God called you to live a joyous life and a full life but God did not call you to live a comfortable life. So if you think that coming to Jesus, you're gonna live this comfortable life and everything is gonna be perfect and rainbows and butterflies and sparkles, it's not, I'm sorry, but that's not, because that's not who you're called to be. And so an easy practical way to reclaim or take possession of the territory that God has given you is When you do your SOAP, and SOAP is a way that we read our Bible and the way that we teach to read our Bible at LOV Impact Ministry. When you read your scripture and you find that one scripture that sticks out to you, meditate on that. Memorize it. Throughout the day, that one scripture, repeat it over and over and over again. For me personally, I screenshot that picture and I put it on my phone as my um, phone background. And I think about that throughout my day and I meditate on that. Because when you memorize scripture, your faith grows. Why? Because you believe that those are truths of God on your life. So that when you later, that faith will give you the ability to act upon that scripture. And you will no longer be afraid because you remember that scripture. You remember what it says and where it was. The enemy will not come in and tell you, You can't say anything because you don't know scripture, but you will know scripture and you will believe scripture. And so you will have the ability to step out in faith and exercise that. And you will, and you know, it's not something that you can do, but you watch, just watch God, just watch God. He will do something amazing. And so reclaim that and God will give you peace of mind and he will give you joy and he'll give you strength. The word of God is your weapon. The white Bible says that it is sharper than any two-edged sword and nothing can stand up against it. Do you believe that tonight? Do you believe tonight that God is calling you to reclaim the territory that you are on? If you believe that tonight, can I have everyone stand up? Everyone just stand up. I'm gonna read one more last scripture. We're gonna go into prayer. This is my favorite, favorite scripture. And it goes like this. It's in Luke 4, 18 through 19. I'm gonna be reading an NIV. It's my favorite scripture. I hope you guys remember it. And if you don't, ask me after service. It says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free. And the NLT version, it says, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The time of the Lord's favor has come. Tonight, if you believe that the spirit of the Lord is upon you, if you believe that he has anointed you, to proclaim the word of God. I hope that you believe. Tonight we're gonna pray, and we're gonna pray that God, if, you, if you're struggling in your faith, we're gonna pray that God will put a fresh fire, a fresh anointing on your heart, that God will speak to you, that God will give you the boldness and the faith and the confidence that it takes to take over the territory that he has given you.